as people are coming on, uh, we are watching some pictures from the bombing of Cambodia or pictures from Cambodia bombing and afterwards. And uh, you may have panelists comment about that as we go. This, of course, it was started under Richard Nixon's tenure. These are not necessarily, those photographs weren't necessarily what happened in the bombing per se, I'm not sure. I don't know who gave them. It could be, just be um, normal warfare. I can't yeah, tell. They're, what they're characterized on I line as from an infamous bombing incident, but I don't know. Oh, that would be Nyeklong. Yeah. Nyeklong, yeah, okay. That was... And these clips have more to do with Vietnam, but are reflective of the work that was being done in the US. These are, Eve Billy was one of the better photographers covering the war. And these are more what it was like when you lived there and covered the wars. This is why I included them. Very different from Vietnam. In what way, Elizabeth, how do you characterize it as? Well, it's a totally different culture, totally different country. The war was short compared to Vietnam. And um, this is obviously a hospital. This was a mortar attack on Phnom Penh. And um, this is a hospital. It was uh, Vietnam's war started right after World War II. This started in 1970. So different culture, different timeline, everything. People are different to quote everything about it. I wrote an, an entire chapter in my book comparing how different the two countries are. That's the final evacuation, 75. And that's, I chose that picture for the last one to give you a sense of, um, of Cambodia back then, what a beautiful country it was and is. And I added in Cambodia today, Phnom Penh today, which when I was there in January, even after a five year absence, I was shocked at how much had changed. And this is Prung Chang, an old friend who came to the US with the Cambodian dancers uh, and who is still very active. He was advising the group of dancers as they prepared for a festival in Singapore. So Cambodia continues. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. We now have uh, people continuing to come in. If you just saw part of those slides, if, if I remember, I will show them to you at the end again. Um, a couple of things about the way we handle our programs. This is one of a series of now probably 20 uh, Zooms that the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee has done. It started out like a lot of other things in his response to COVID, but we continue it because it obviously is a way of engaging people uh, with a very special interest from all over the country and in, indeed all over the world. Um, most of you have probably already seen the bios. Uh, if not, I will put on the chat the link to the bios page um, and uh, you will get a maybe a bit of an introduction as we go into the program. Um, the chat will be 
I can send things out, but you, the audience won't be able to write on it until we go to discussion. And then I'll open it up and you can see who your long lost friends are or people that you want to send a note to, or you can obviously chat with everybody or with the speakers at that point. Um, the Q&A, you can put questions on them now. Um, they, and they will be visible to the the speakers um, at the when we go over to the discussion or the Q and A. Um, the speakers may just pick them out themselves, or I will try and pick out the most salient or most repeated or edit together questions. Um, so again. If you want the bios, uh, go to that blog page if you haven't already, and there are a couple of, of resources that have been added. So I will turn it over now to Skip Isaacs, Arnold Isaacs, who is an old friend and a, one of the journalists like Elizabeth, who helped us to, like Elizabeth Becker, who helped us to understand what was going on uh, in events and a places that were vitally important to many of our lives. So Skip, take it away. Thank you, John. Uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, 12 days from now, um, on the 15th, uh, it will be 50 years since the United States stopped bombing in Cambodia, and which was the last US combat action in the Indochina war. And the bombing was halted by a congressional process it didn't only cut off funds for the one specific military operation, but required, uh, as Representative Paul McCluskey, uh, Pete McCluskey, sought to clarify during the debate, quote, all military activity in and over Laos, Cambodia, and North and South Vietnam would cease unless the president came back to the Congress and asked for and obtained authority to commence military activity. And as we know, that never happened. There was, there was no further uh, military activity. So August 15th was the real end of the American war, a milestone that you would think would be more prominently remembered uh, than it is. My impression is, uh, and I think the other panelists will verify this, that at the time in 73, the discussion in Congress and the public focused mainly on the narrower issue of Cambodia, the Cambodia air campaign. There was surprisingly little on the broader scope of the legislation. And in part, that's because the legislative story itself is very complicated and, and involved, uh, not a simple story at all. But uh, but this, this webinar will look at two narratives, one specifically on Cambodia and, the, and in, in a broad way, the congressional response, and the other on the larger story about the broader restriction on executive war making power and what that meant uh, after August 1573. And in connection with the first narrative, I'll add, Elizabeth mentioned this during the photo show, that the war in Cambodia had a very different character from the war in Vietnam, different in the battlefield and in the society. And those differences also, like the story of the halt, were largely overshadowed in the US debate on the war. And they've remained pretty obscure even in retrospect. So I won't, would not be at all surprised if many of the details you hear about will be new to quite a few people in this, in this audience. Our speakers today all speak from firsthand memories, from different angles of vision on that, on that history. Without repeating all the details from the bios, I will mention that Elizabeth Becker was the Washington Post correspondent in Cambodia in 1973 and 74. She was in Phnom Penh on the day the bombing stopped. And a couple of years later, she was also one of very small number of journalists who had a look at Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge period. And her book, When the War Was Over, is absolutely indispensable for understanding that badly remembered chapter of the Indochina story. Jack Sullivan was a staff member for the House Foreign Affairs Committee, traveled to Cambodia and other places, other Indochina countries on a number of occasions. Uh, and before and after the August 73 halt, including a memorable visit uh, just in early 1975, just weeks before the final defeat uh, of the US backed armies in Cambodia and South, Viet and South Vietnam. And Larry Levin uh, ran the coalition to stop funding the war, a lobbying group 
representing a variety of organizations that were trying to stop funding for the war. And I will add that I also was an eyewitness in Indochina. I covered the war for the Baltimore Sun between 1972 and the end in 1975, and later wrote Without Honor, Defeat in Vietnam and, and Cambodia, which just reissued last year. And to open this discussion, before we get to the main narrative, I thought I would ask each speaker, this is what journalists Elizabeth will recognize this, call an anecdotal lead. I thought I'd ask each speaker to tell us about a particular moment or encounter or sort of a personal awakening uh, on this story. And then we'll go on in a second round to treat the subject more generally. And the logical person to start with would be Elizabeth, who was on the ground in Cambodia, heard those bombs dropping for weeks and months before. And then the last ones uh, on the day of the, of the call. So Elizabeth, any specific scene or moment that sticks in your mind after 50 years? <laughs> well, of course, I, I reviewed my notes in my books, so this is not uh, spontaneous. Um, the bombing began, the heavy bombing began in March. And what first, when anybody talks about bombing is to, to say the reason, this happened after the Paris Peace Accords were signed. Cambodia was the only country left out. So as a journalist, the first article I wrote was in March 19th, 1973, where it, was, it wasn't as if we had a press um, release from the embassy saying they had started this intensive bombing. You, we went out and reported. And um, I wrote down in my notes that the article said there's an unprecedented portion um, of the bombing no longer restricted to the border regions. We don't know essentially where we're going, but it's unprecedented. And then by July, in the single month of July, 51,900 tons of bombs were dropped. Now, that, that's a number. And what it felt like was everywhere. Of course, it wasn't everywhere, but um, a country whose war was so short and so new we were astonished and we were surrounded that last August 15th, our small little press corps blossomed, ballooned. You can't, hundreds, hundreds of reporters. And I was one of three Washington Post reporters and I went to Batambang um, in northeast, Northwest Cambodia to watch the Cambodians who thought that the war was coming into end and were fleeing across to um, Thailand. It was that moment where everyone thought it would be over and it wasn't. And I'm gonna pass on to the next person. Okay. Uh, Jack, Larry. Thank you. Uh, any moment that sticks in your mind, Jack? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> my first trip there was uh, in uh, 1971, December and um, uh, I, uh, one moment of particular interest was, uh, we, uh, were, uh, my, my, uh, I had one person with me and, uh, we were hosted, uh, by Sassanese Fernandez, who was the commander in chief in, uh, the army, which was then engaged, uh, fighting the Vietnamese. And, um, we uh, had our lunch. He invited me to a lunch in a bunker, which was pine paneled and very luxurious. And at lunch, we had, uh, we started with uh, Hennessy cognac, we had duck a la ange, and we had uh, French champagne. And I said uh, to Sassine Fernandez, uh, uh, we are in a war zone. And I said, this seems to be fairly luxurious. And his answer to me was, when the relief helicopter comes in, we insist on our plasma and our champagne. And I was frankly shocked and appalled and said, these guys don't know what they're involved in. And of course, they were taking full advantage of what the Americans were giving. I'm sure that the American dollars paid for our lunch and it also paid for all of the luxury goods 
things like uh, microwaves and televisions and even automobiles that they were bringing back from the US or other places where they were training by being trained by the American forces. So uh, right at the get go, I was very pessimistic um, about, the, about the events that would occur in the future. Larry? Well, I have to say that in Washington, um, the memory that stands out the most out of all these years when Congress was debating and the administration was increasing uh, American involvement or American funding, what stood out most was the one vote. Um, despite all the complications that Skip talked about, which is true, despite all the um, sub-amendments and the um, supplemental vote, everything that takes place in Congress to confuse you. One vote made the difference. And that is that vote that actually stopped the bombing of Cambodia on an amendment to in the House of Representatives to kill it, uh, to kill an amendment from the Senate that would have stopped the voting, stopped the bombing. And that vote in the House of Representatives was tied 204 to 204. So it failed to delete or delay the amendment to cut off the bombing. And that was a young C-SPAN at the time broadcasting that. And you could watch the votes clicking up one by one, 170 to 170, 190 to 190. Uh, and finally, it came down to the last minute and the votes uh, equaled and tied. So the amendment to stop the bombing was passed. And I would argue um, that that, and I would assert that that vote was a direct result of a rejuvenated and sophisticated anti-war movement um, that was largely responsible for that vote taking place because of a new strategy, a new leadership, and new tactics. And it was a recognition of that leadership and strategy and tactics that realized that while the decision was, decisions were being made in Washington, the power levers to influence those decisions were not in Washington. They were in the districts of the Congress members who were voting on them. They were in the golf clubs, they were in the churches, they were in the schools. So that teachers, doctors, um, mainstream America was directly contacted um, by this new rejuvenated anti-war movement to influence that vote. And I will, ass will assert that that made the difference in that vote, uh, the Thai vote to stop the bombing of Cambodia and the future votes to cut off aid to South Vietnam. And I'll be happy to, to get into more details about that in a context, uh, discuss a context uh, for this new rejuvenated anti-war movement and how it differed from the past and what it actually did uh, to accomplish winning these votes. I, I guess we go on to a somewhat uh, A broader and B narrower discussion of the actual laws that we we're talking about. Uh, Jack, what was your sensation? I'm, I, I think you were you were certainly working for the House Committee at that time. Uh, I will point out to, to that the other thing that changed, I mean, I, besides, I was in Asia, I wasn't in Washington during this period. So I was not a firsthand witness to, to that kind of stuff. Uh, but the other sort of, but it is a, a, a cogent fact that at the time this vote took place, unlike all the previous ones, there were no more American troops in South Vietnam. They'd all left. And so the, the, the need, the political need to be, not to be seen to be pulling the rug out from under American troops in the, on the battlefield had disappeared. And I think that was also a factor. Uh, Jack, what did you think was the, the change or the mood or the attitudes that shaped this, this, the, these votes in 1973? Well, uh, I think Larry's correct. A lot of it came from the uh, grassroots. Um, 
uh, I was involved in Wisconsin politics a bit and was hearing that out of people from there. Um, but uh, I think that um, there had been a, a real sea change. And one of the key elements was um, in, uh, and I can't give you the date, uh, but it was probably about 1974 when the Democratic caucus uh, changed and, and opposed the war. And that, uh, that changed the chair of my committee, Foreign Affairs Committee, who had agreed to quash that report that I made about Cambodia, which was very negative and which the military, which Pentagon wanted uh, to deep six. And uh, it was, and he then, the Democrats on our committee uh, insisted to be resuscitated. So they received page proofs and uh, held a hearing on them. And I think it had an impact on a lot of the Democrats on the committee and probably some of the Republicans that uh, this uh, adventure, if you call it that, in Cambodia had been a doomed one from the beginning. Elizabeth, what what do you remember? What was what was it like in, in Cambodia? What was the reaction in Cambodia when the bombing stopped on August fifteenth? You mentioned people up in the up in the northeast northwest uh, yeah. fleeing over or across the Thailand. But what was, was what? What do you remember of the 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 apparent effects of that moment uh, on the ground in Cambodia? I'd like to back up for a second and and show the talk about the Cambodia side of of just what we've heard. Um, it was it's easy it was easy for people to belittle and make fun of of Cambodians like General Sustin Fernandez and there's a, lots of stories. Isn't this funny? Lan Nol likes magic. Buddhist stuff, um, but culturally, as I said, they were different and they were not, this was not a completely doomed thing from the beginning, that the American role way precedes the bombing that we're talking about. The Americans from President Eisenhower wanted to undermine Prince Norodom Sina, who's a major figure who we haven't talked about yet. And 1970 is an important date because that's when Sihanouk was overthrown in a semi-democratic overthrow that was not, as many people think, it was not an American coup, but once the coup was taken place, the Americans immediately supported it as a fourth supporting of the war. There was a short invasion that only lasted a couple of months. And then from then on, the Cambodians were on their own. And they were faced, as one person said, the Vietnamese. So um, it, was, it was a completely different um, war. And what happened was leading up now to 1973 is that Watergate is going on. And that very much chills the whole discussion right. of war. It was not a, it, first of all, Cambodia was never a popular war in the sense that the American soldiers were fighting there. It was Americans were fighting there. It was Cambodians, Vietnamese versus Cambodians, and then later the Khmer Rouge itself. So it was never, it was not a popular war. Cooper Church was passed in 1970 to restrict it. So it never had full support at all and was misunderstood. So um, uh, there was a great deal of fear and sadness and confusion in Cambodia. I can't exaggerate what it was like when the bombing is going on and, and I'm, I'm gonna bore you with some figures, but um, in, in 1973, after the peace accords, when the United States was only allowed to, to bomb Cambodia, that year they dropped um, 273,728 bombs. That's half a year. And that's half of the total that were bombed for the entire war from um, 65 to 73. So it was, people were fleeing from the countryside to Phnom Penh. The city was overrun. There wasn't food. The, um, you had refugees, you had every problem that you can think of with refugees. People were try trying to figure out, can we flee? What will happen if the war ends? Um, it was nothing like it in Saigon, nothing like it in Vietnam. It came on top of people all at once. Um, and um, it, was, it was scary, it was very scary. Um, the bombing did 
accomplish what the embassy, what the Americans wanted it to accomplish. They stopped the Khmer Rouge at that stage, but um, it was the, the everybody knew this was the end of the American involvement, active involvement, and they were scared out of their minds. The, it was very frightening for Cambodians. Very frightening, whether you're talking about officials or um, the general population. But underneath it all, they were hoping that Cambodians would never hurt other Cambodians and that if whoever, if the Khmer Rouge won, that it would be okay. And that very much is the mood. And um, they never accepted that the, uh, the Paris Peace Accords would, hurt, would um, hurt them so much. And I can talk later about why Cambodia was c cut out of the Paris Peace Accords. But it was, it was dramatic. Not, as I said, nothing. Even the end of the war in, in Saigon was nothing compared to sort of the, the disintegration right. in Cambodia. Well, Vietnam disintegrated uh, not so much in Saigon, but uh, elsewhere in, in Vietnam, the, the scenes in, at the end and the collapse were pretty horrendous too. Uh, and I guess that takes us sort of into the next topic that I was thinking that we should at least mention, which is what happened afterward. I and mean, as, as you know, the US forces were no longer directly engaged, but the wars in Cambodia and Vietnam continued for nearly two more years uh, before the decisive communist victories, separate and decisive victories in both countries in April of 1975. Uh, and so maybe Elizabeth, you could give a short history lesson on that last chapter in Cambodia. And I will maybe step out of my moderator role for a few minutes and give a little thumbnail about the end of the war in Vietnam, which I covered. I, I was also in Cambodia in January and February of 75. I went back to Vietnam in March when when that when things started collapsing there. So I was not there at the absolute tail end in, in Cambodia. Uh, and during that time, as Jack mentioned, I guess that uh, there were also cuts in U.S. aid to those to the Saigon and Phnom Penh government. They 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 reduced the aid. They did not cut it. It never was cut off, uh, as is frequently alleged. But uh, that didn't happen. There was never a, a total cutoff of that aid. But it was it was reduced, and that certainly in, in substantial ways affected the situation. So uh, Elizabeth, you want to sort of well um, give us a little history lesson. Seventy four, well, seventy five in Cambodia. Well, um, the first years of the war, the Vietnamese, um, the NVA carried the, the battle responsibility for the battle in, in Cambodia. They did the heavy lifting, which allowed the Khmer Rouge to develop and train on behind the lines, which is the opposite, whereas the Khmer Republic was fighting the North Vietnamese all those first years. And it was only with the Paris Peace Accords that the North Vietnamese left. They, in fact, the Khmer Republic had a big um, uh, ceremony to explain to us that they, had, that they had left and they thought that would work because they had no idea how good the Khmer Rouge would be. Um, so, 73, the Khmer Rouge get much closer than people expected. And then 74, it starts out with a bang. They're doing very well. Now, behind the, if we had been able to see behind the lines, we'd know that one of the reasons is that they were they were willing to lose lots of soldiers to get ahead. They were fresh troops compared to the Khmer Republic. And um, they, um, they had won the advantage of Prince Sihanouk was on their side. The reason was because um, he was overthrown and he, he took refuge in China. Um, and two, by then, um, the Khmer Republic was um, becoming encircled. The Mekong River was um, being choked by 75. The Pochentong Airport was being encircled. Um, the the corruption became um, the the corruption, which was already bad, became much much worse. And um, there was uh, there was no question that um, at the end, towards the end, who was going to win? But the question was, who were the Khmer Rouge? And they were the um, the least um, prepared for governing, they were the the most radical. We learned later, although when I wrote a piece about them in 1974, um, when Pol Pot's name was still Solat Tsar, uh, 
it was um, it was treated as strange because already there was fissures with the Vietnamese communists and already they were seen as radical, but we didn't realize how radical. Um, and um, so they won. They won in 1975. And um, from the first day, they started their radical revolution. And um, as Skip said, I did interview Pol Pot. I was one of two journalists to do that. And um, that was just before the Vietnamese invasion. And I'll just add here that um, the Cambodians were not prepared to, for the genocide they had that occurred under the Khmer Rouge. Um, they were thrown out of their homes, sent to the countryside to, um, to essentially a forced labor camps, um, not enough food, poor medical care, and a lot, out of a population of some 5,000 um, 6,000, 2,000 died of either being executed or um, died of medical or starvation. I won't go million, into- Million, not thousand. Million, sorry. Um, <laughs> there, um, it's, um, it's you, you can't discuss it in just a few minutes, but um, one question that always comes up is, so who's responsible for the Khmer Rouge? And um, I can't answer that in two seconds, but um, let me say it's not a simple answer. And it is, um, it took me um, years to even write the book about it, but um, everybody can feel responsible for it. Um, and it's not just one thing. And um, the repercussions continue to this day. Yeah, and I will, as I said, I will step out of the moderator's chair for a, a few seconds, a few minutes, and point out that in 1973, the Paris Agreement in, in South Vietnam was supposed to uh, start off with a ceasefire in place, that, that the armed forces of both sides would stop where they were and stop shooting at each other, and that there would then be a negotiating process uh, to, to find some way to a uh, new government for, for South Vietnam. And that never happened. Nobody ever stopped shooting. Nobody was really, neither the South Vietnamese government nor the North Vietnamese and, the, and their uh, local allies, the Viet Cong, were in any way committed to actually to a ceasefire, and nobody did. And the, the North Vietnamese, well, that's a long story, which I won't go into detail, but the South Vietnamese were actually on the offensive for almost for all the rest of 1973 and, and into the early 1974, they recaptured quite a bit of territory, although it was supposed to be a ceasefire in place, but they reoccupied quite a bit of territory that had been more or less under communist control. It's not as quite as simple as I'm making it sound, but that was the, the net effect. But then uh, the tide turned in, in 1974 and, and the, the communists began to make gains and, and the South Vietnamese had occupied a lot of territory that they couldn't really defend against a major offensive. And their policy, which remained their policy to the last minute, which I think was absolutely suicidal, was to hold every square yard of territory that they could, where they could, where their troops could put some boots down. And they continued to do that. And then of course, when a big offensive started at the, at the very end of 74 and, and in the first weeks of 75, they lost thousands of troops and millions of tons of supplies that they could have saved, that, that they didn't have to lose if they hadn't tried to hold on to all those territories. And then in, in March, they finally did be, decide to, to, President Tu finally did decide to strategically withdraw from territory that they felt that they couldn't defend, but it was too late. And that withdrawal turned into a panicky uh, flight uh, the generals left before their troops that they commanded. In effect, they deserted by any reasonable use of the word. And South Vietnam folded up to everybody's amazement. I expect this is just as amazing to the North the Vietnamese communists as it was to the people on our side, uh, that in six weeks, everything was over. And the communist tanks rolled into Saigon and the war, and the war was over. Uh, and the, the last Americans left at the Meanwhile, the Cambodian evacuation was, I think, on the 12th of April, mm. and the Saigon evacuation was several weeks later on the 29th of April, uh, which, which I, I, that's when I left. Uh, so that was the, the end result. Uh, and the failure of the Paris Agreement and the Paris ceasefire 
You can argue on all other a lot of other issues. You can argue about which side was more to blame uh, for the, the evils of that of that war. But as far as disregarding the ceasefire, I think the blame was absolutely equal on both sides. Neither side ever for five minutes uh, wanted to decided to honor that uh, commitment, and they didn't. And the Americans didn't do anything to stop that. As soon as they got their prisoners back, they stopped whatever they hadn't really been leaning on the South Vietnamese before then, and then they completely stopped leaning on them after that. So that's my capsule history lesson. Uh, Jack and Larry, what about, as I say, this was during the period when Congress was reducing military aid. And I wonder how you remember the mood in Congress in that period and the attitudes and events that shaped those aid votes. The crucial ones were in August of 74. Well, um, one of the things that was um, that was mentioned earlier is that uh, clearly the Watergate had an effect uh, that spread over to Indochina, that uh, Nixon's uh, credibility as president and what he had, what he was doing uh, came into uh, into uh, just bad repute, and uh, also. Uh, the, there's a strong shift among the Democrats in Congress well, that um, against the war, and it was, and I can't tell you the exact date, but the, Demo the things really changed for me in the in the committee and what I was about able to do when um, the Democratic uh, caucus came out against the war in both places and in, in, in Cambodia and. Um, and in Vietnam, it was, a, it was a closed meeting and no, never saw a record of it, but that's what happened. The chairman then uh, set, set my partner and me loose to um, really talk about what, what we could, what we could, uh, um, what we had to say about our own experience there. And, um, as a result, things then began to shift. And um, that was because before that, uh, a lot of the Democrats had been very much behind the uh, war in both places. Yeah, I think Jack is accurate in that. And that was a turning point. And I remember specifically working on that extensively on particular members of the Democratic caucus that we thought were susceptible and open to changing their opinion. And it, it's a little bit ironic when I talk about a, a rejuvenated anti-war movement that can take responsibility for this. Because at the time of the bombing, uh, the cutoff of the bomb, the funding for the bombing of Cambodia, um, it, which did first pass overwhelmingly in the Senate, but one anti-war senator um, in a speech said, how short are memories? How still our voices, gone are the peace rallies, gone are the sacks full of mail, gone are the earnest college students walking up and down the hallways of the Senate office buildings, lobbying senators to vote for peace. Maybe it's because the draft has ended. Maybe it's stupefying cynicism about the whole governmental process as being incapable of responding. Maybe we're so emotionally drained that we simply no longer have the ability to care. So when I heard this speech and people working with me heard that speech, we all kind of giggled. We laughed because the senator who was saying that was basing it on an idea of the peace movement that was passe, that had passed. Because as I said in my introduction, the peace movement had become more sophisticated about the levers of power to influence Washington. And that had to do where the decisions could be made, the power levers could be made in their districts. And that is um, what happened in the last three years. And just to put it in context, let me create a context for this, because first of all, um, you know, remember this is the year after the defeat of the peace candidate, George McGovern. It's a year or two after the uh, unsuccessful, relatively unsuccessful Vietnam mobilization in Washington, D.C. to shut down the city, which of course didn't happen, although there were a lot of people there and there were, the, I think, the largest number of arrests in a single day in U.S. history at the time. And also right before that, the Kent State shootings, when students uh, 
protested and uprisings on campus uh, at the beginning of the incursion into Cambodia by Nixon when he started that. Now, concurrent with all this at the same period were the first polls in 1971, I believe, showing a majority of Americans wanted out of Southeast Asia, period. And that all of those things were leading up to these votes taking place. And what happened in the year before when the govern was defeated is several organizations and leaders together to discuss where to go and realized that the mass rallies, the sacks of mail, the um, uh, street protests um, had to go move in a new direction. And that new direction was Congress because the American people clearly didn't want to continue and Congress was being affected by that kind of attitude. So at that time, people in several organizations came together, particularly the Indochina Peace Campaign and a group called Medical Aid for Indochina, which was quietly sending uh, uh, medical supplies and funds to North Vietnam uh, to help with their medical needs uh, against the, uh, the, the laws of the United States. And when the Bach Mai Hospital was bombed at the Christmas bombing of 1972, that medical aid program became extremely visible and important and a major motivating factor um, with celebrities doing concerts. And what came out of that is that many professional people learned how to circumvent the US government to get things done and to uh, assert an anti-war presence in Washington. That led to this movement in 1973 to have a coalition, 72 and 70, a coalition to stop funding the war uh, of religious groups, civic organizations like Common Cause, labor unions like the United Auto Workers and mainstream anti-war organizations, particularly the Indochina Peace Campaign uh, that was originally founded by Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda and came to Washington to quietly meet with members of Congress, to do seminars in the halls of Congress, and to set up call centers, literal call centers in Washington that would analyze and focus on the congressional districts of vulnerable members of Congress who could be influenced to vote against the war, both in Cambodia and in South Vietnam. And that's when this new phase of the anti-war movement began with people in anti-war activists in call centers, calling members districts and the key influencers in those districts, as I said, in churches and golf clubs, uh, in friendships and neighborhoods, to speak with members of Congress directly about voting against the war. I remember specifically on the vote to cut off the bombing of Cambodia uh, and one vulnerable member. I remember that day speaking to both a golf partner and a mistress of this oh. one member of Congress. And both said they would speak to the congressman about it um, and, and try to influence his vote. Other activists were doing different things. Uh, there was one Republican member of Congress uh, in the House that was going to vote to cut off funding, but was under enormous pressure from the Nixon Ford administration at that time. Uh, Silvio Conti in Massachusetts, a Republican. And there were many Republicans that were supporting the cutoff of funding. Um, and he said his feet were in, con in concrete. He was not going to change his vote. Uh, but he was under enormous pressure. And one of our great organizers in Western Massachusetts, where he was from, Brewster Rhodes, organized on all the college campuses in Western Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts uh, for students to have giant bags of concrete and envelopes to send Silvio Conte in Washington uh, little pieces of concrete dust to help him keep his feet strong and resist the pressure of um, uh, the Ford and uh, Nixon administration. So it's those kind of activities to influence what both the Democratic uh, Caucus that Jack Sullivan uh, wrote up, just spoke about and the members' votes on uh, the various 
um, votes to cut off funding. And I, I, I also want to say that um, this was not happening in the abstract. Uh, and it's true there was a deflated anti-war movement before this because of what I spoke about, the defeat of McGovern, the failure of the Vietnam mobilization in Washington, the shootings of Kent State. But I have to say that the reporting that came out of Indochina and that continued to come out by Elizabeth, by Skip, by others, had a profound effect in Washington after the peace agreement, the Paris peace agreement was signed to indicate that the war was continuing and by other means that the suffering was continued, continuing uh, to a vast extent funded by American military and economic aid, which was often diverted into military aid. So part of this rejuvenation of the peace movement came from the continued reporting after American troops left. I, I do feel uh, at this point compelled to uh, point out that uh, change, the situation on the ground had changed also, and that the changing attitudes in Congress reflected that. And I, I had a, one of the quotes that I've always remembered is in my book, uh, was from Senator Norris Cotton of New Hampshire, who uh, described himself uh, in this is, I don't think it was specifically on the votes on the, the Eagleton Amendment and, and that kind of thing that we've been talking about here, but at some point in early 73, after the Paris Agreement, uh, and I don't remember exactly what the context was, Cotton uh, said, oh, this is during a hearing with uh, the, the Secretary of Defense, Elliot Richardson, and, he, and Cotton said something like, said this, this is right out of the congressional record. I guess I have been about as regular a Republican, about as hard, loyal an administration Republican as there is in the whole Senate. Uh, he said, but now that Americans are out of Vietnam, he said, speaking as a dyed in the wool, mossback administration Republican, I do not want to go on record to authorize one red cent to continue hostilities in Southeast Asia. I think it perhaps has a little more significance for me to say it than for some of my friends. Who, who have been fighting the battle all back through the through the through the years? They've been doves all the time. I've just been a dove since we got our prisoners back. I recognize that. Anyway, anyway, there's more to to it than that. Oh, let but me I let me. The, can the, I the, just, the again, political... just one minute, please? Because yeah, yeah. we're talking to a peace group, um, and bef I want to say something about 1968 because the 1970 Par Paris Peace Accords very closely resembled what President Johnson was working towards in 1968. It was scuttled um, behind the scenes by um, Richard Nixon, who was running for president. And if you look at what we've just talked about, 73, 68, I would argue that if, if President Johnson had been able to complete that 1968 peace accords, we wouldn't have even had a war in Cambodia. At that stage, Sihanouk was still the leader it was very much in China and Russia's um, Soviet Union's interest to keep him there. The Khmer Rouge were not encouraged to, to fight against him. And um, it just breaks my heart whenever we talk about um, Paris Peace Accords and I imagine what 68 was like. And then finally, we can't talk about this war without talking about Laos. Um, someone mentioned that in, in the questions. And it was, uh, I think, proportionately per population, the most bombed country in the history of the world. Um, uh, the total was uh, 2,136,380 tons for a very sparsely uh, populated poor rural country. And um, I'm not an expert, but um, when we talk about the post-war issues, I think Laos has one of the, of the most, um, uh, a country with the most um, problems with uh, ammunition buried and so on and so forth. So. We haven't forgotten Laos. Well, I, I don't disagree with anything you said, although I will point out that, that uh, I don't think you can take as, as an assumption that the kind of peace agreement that Johnson would have negotiated was, was possible in 68, because at that time and for four more years, the Vietnamese communists were, their position on the negotiations was that not only did the United States have to withdraw, but they had to overthrow to oust the government of, of the South Vietnam and, and dismantle, disarm and dismantle the South Vietnamese army. 
which is a, a term that, uh, I mean, had the negotiations gone on, maybe they would have backed down from that earlier than they did, but that was their position, remained that, that oh, yeah. 1972. Yeah. And that is a, a condition that I can't imagine any American president uh, would have accepted. So I, I don't know that you can, that there's any sort of grounds for assuming that the, that the agreement that, that was agreed, that was reached in 1973 could have been reached at that much earlier. Well, several, I've been on panels with several experts on Vietnam, um, and most recently was um, Emperors of War, Fred Logoval, who made that same point that 68, they started out at the same position, but he presumed that they could have gone down to what was agreed to in Paris. And I'll just finish this off, and, um, and other Vietnamese experts say, but it wouldn't have made any difference in Vietnam, it would have been the same result. And of course, it would have made a huge difference in Cambodia if that war had ended and not spread over into Cambodia. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm, I mean, I, I'm I think a mom expert, but this is what they said. And I disagree. I think it would have made a huge difference in Cambodia. Huge. No, no I, that's, that's a perfectly plausible argument. I'm just pointing out that it's not an yeah. automatic assumption. Oh, no, no. no. Uh, and I think that we should, and we're getting a little bit away from the uh, sort of the, the topic that we're focusing on here. Uh, if I could do a riff on what Larry said, uh, when we came when we came back from that trip in uh, uh, to uh, to Cambodia in March of '75, um, the uh, Ford administration Ford uh, asked and Kissinger asked for about another few hundred million dollars to go to uh, to go to Cambodia, and. Um, I uh, was asked to write up some kind of legislation because the funds then came through the Foreign Affairs Committee. And um, it was the hardest thing I've ever done is to try to cobble something together. that I really didn't think was a very wise thing, but I was asked to do it, so I did it. And uh, interestingly enough, we could not get any congressman to sponsor it. Not a single conservative congressman at that point was willing to put his name or her name on that piece of legislation. And nothing happened. And then Cambodia fell. It would have fallen anyway. Yeah. And it's very doubtful that any of that aid would ever have gotten to Cambodia Absolutely. anyway. Absolutely. I mean, this was, this was theatrics, I think, more than actual policy. Be correct. Uh, well, just following up on what Skip said there about quoting the Republican um, senator, which was very uh, emblematic of of an attitude among conservative senators, particularly conservative Republicans. And but it was even more specific on Cambodia. I don't know, Elizabeth, if you ever heard this. And of course, the realism is, you know, I, I, unknown. But a number of Republican senators said they were gonna to vote to cut off funding for the bombing of Cambodia um, solely for the reason because they feared the danger of American pilots being shot down again. And uh, that reigniting American involvement in the war and giving a justification uh, for Nixon to continue. I don't know if that was realistic or not, whether there was any kind of firepower that could have done that. Maybe they were referring to the North Vietnamese army being near there, but that was specifically a reason that they voted to cut off the, the uh, Republic, conservative Republicans, several said for that reason, they didn't, they were worried about American pilots being shot down. No, I mean, yeah. in fact, I don't know of any instances where they were shot down over Cambodia, I could be wrong. Um, someone no, just put, someone yeah. just put in the chat, what was more common is that there were so few um, military targets or targets that they would drop their bombs in um, lakes or the ocean on the way back to their bases in Thailand, which you know, one thinks of what's been left behind by us. But no, it was very much Watergate. It was very much um, cut off funding. And um, I, get, I hear this and I also remember um, the effect it had on Cambodians who, that Cambodian lives who, who you know were just shocked and um, traumatized by um, what that they were being left behind. It's it can't be. Fun. Well, 
Uh, do any of the panelists have any sort of other questions or comments to direct to each other before we turn to the audience, or maybe we're about ready to open it up? Okay. Anybody else? Larry? Well, I wanted to ask Jack if he, I mean, what he noticed in Congress. I mean, did, did, did he see this change happening abruptly or over time, or when did it coalesce as a anti-war movement in Congress that said, regardless of what the cost is, regardless of what the effect is going to be in Southeast Asia, America does not belong there. It coalesced after the Democratic caucus vote, which I, the exact date of, I can't tell you, I wasn't involved. And uh, once it was, once that changed, it, it was like a sea change for what people were, were, were willing to listen to about where we were and what was going to happen. That was it. And uh, it's, uh, uh, but that was, uh, that from my point of view, that was what changed the, 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 uh, the tenor of the whole discussion. And it had a lot to do with Watergate, as, as Elizabeth has said. And the kind of work you folks were doing in the hinterland. Well, I, there, there's one question I saw about the role uh, that someone asked about the role of the Vietnam veterans uh, in the anti-war movement, the rejuvenated anti-war movement. And I think that role was essential because uh, what the Vietnam veterans did in the congressional districts, and again, this wasn't a, a big national publicity, publicity scene or a big national movement, it was very focused. The same reason that senator thought that nothing was happening because there was no street rallies um, uh, because we didn't feel there was a strategy uh, or tactics for street rallies that were necessary. But the Vietnam veterans were going to speak to their Congress members in the districts and going to speak to community groups and churches. And that had a very powerful effect. The, the veterans actually took over one of the hearings I was running on Vietnam and uh, uh, with John Kerry uh, as one of the speakers. And uh, it was, uh, that also had a big effect on the members. Okay, shall we open for questions and comments from the audience, John? Yes. Can't hear you. Yes. John, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I had between ringing phones and dogs, I wanted to spare everybody. <laughs> um, the speakers are welcome to pull questions out. Um, I've sent notes to a couple of people that I've seen that have posed questions. Uh, I have the ability to lift people up into active screen discussion, but you have to send me a note on the chat to do that, send it directly to me and I can pull you up. But just looking at the questions, um, one of the uh, questions that wasn't written and Elizabeth alluded to, and had we uh, in some ways a, a more diverse audience, I mean, we have, we've had 114 people actually, they're still on right now, but this tends to be people with a history in the anti-war movement um, or academic interest. Um, but one of the, had we more conservative people online, I'm sure one of the questions that would be asked was, so did was stopping the bombing a big mistake because that's what allowed the Khmer Rouge to come to power? Or would you say, what, what's your, what would your reaction be to that question, Elizabeth? Can you, I'm not sure, wait, had they came to power because of the bombing? It would, if the US had had not stopped the bombing, would that have prevented the Khmer Rouge from coming to power? That, that's one of those hypotheticals. I, I, um, I doubt it. Um, the whole situation had changed. Um, uh, I'll answer a question that I just saw on the on the chat. That's that I think is more to the point. Um, uh, 
uh, why, why was um, Cambodia not involved in the peace accords that would have supposedly stopped the fighting? That's because um, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, who was in charge of the negotiations, refused to, to talk to the Cambodians. He thought that the Vietnamese would bring them to the table. So in the few, in the early years when there might have been a possibility, and I'm saying there was a strong one, but there might have been a possibility of using Sihanouk to figure out some way to, to um, bring, um, bring an end to the war in Cambodia. Kissinger refused to talk to him. And so just like he thought the Chinese would bring the Vietnamese to the table previously. So when he sits with the Vietnamese, he thinks they can bring the Cambodians to the table and the Vietnamese say, no way, you know, North Vietnam cannot bring them. And, um, and then at that point, the Khmer Rouge were doing so well that they said, no, we're not coming to the table. So it's the only country that did not. And, and that's, uh, to me, the more interesting question. If we had tried earlier on and not been so arrogant about not talking to see and trying to get an early, um, earlier peace accords, what would have happened? But the bombing alone, I can't see it. I mean, I don't, I don't see it, but I'm, I can't pretend that anybody could answer that question. I also wanted to ask, answer a couple questions that were um, in the Larry for all of these successful boat boats. I'm what now? Hello. You're frozen. Start over again. Oh, I wanted to also answer a couple questions in the chat um, that were there, and I particularly wanted to point out and um, and uh, recognize that before all these successful votes and this a uh, coalescence on Washington, there had been people in Washington working for many years educating Congress. Don Luce. Uh, people from the um, International Voluntary Service like Jane Barton, uh, and particularly Fred Brantman from the Indochina Resource Center, who were going to Congress with substantive information based on their personal experience and based on their research that had a very big impact on Congress in laying the groundwork for members of Congress when there wasn't a majority to stop the bombing, when there wasn't a majority to end the war um, in Congress. But they laid the groundwork with substantive content and information and firsthand experiences to begin the questioning in Congress of, is this right? Should this continue? So there was a long history. I, I don't want to minimize that. What I'm saying is that there's a difference after the 72 election when there was a massive focus away from everything else in the peace movement onto Washington. And that supplemented and complemented the work of these other people, Fred Brafman, the Indochina resource people, Don Luce, the uh, IVS people. So I did want to emphasize that, and that was in a question. Any of the other speakers see a question they want to respond to? Elizabeth, way back in the beginning, Stephen Spitz said that uh, he, in the course he took on Southeast Asian politics, the professor said the only Southeast Asian leader who was truly popular at that time was Prince Sihanouk. Was is that your assessment? It was he definitely popular? Um, that's no. That's the question. I mean, uh, all through, uh, he was. He, he was given credit for independence from the French, um, whether Billy deserved or not. He was a very charismatic, he was a world leader. So yes, he was popular. However, by the time um, the war starts, he's, um, he's, he's facing a lot of internal political pushback, um, not just from uh, the military, which eventually takes over, but from the young professionals who th thought he was holding them back from becoming modern like the the ties from uh, people who worried that his neutrality was leaning too too much towards um, Vietnamese. Although after what he saw the Americans were doing in South Vietnam, he had decided they were not gonna win, that they were treating South Vietnam like a banana republic, and he was gonna try to remain neutral. And that's a very important thing. Cambodia was neutral from, from, uh, from 55, their independence up until 70. They were, they, he, yes, he cheated and he let 
um, the Vietnamese communists do this, he let the South Vietnamese um, uh, RVN do that, but they were neutral and um, he couldn't have done that if he hadn't been so popular. So yeah, he was popular. I noted in the Q&A, and I don't know if this is visible to everyone or not, but the Q&A and the chat will be posted on the blog page with the bios uh, in a day or two. But there's a long article from the New York Times uh, from August 15th, 1973, in which Dan Berrigan and 60 people in all were arrested uh, at the White House uh, because of their protest of, of the US bombing. So if you can, if you can see that, look at the Q&A now, but if not, it will be available um, many. Uh, any other questions on, on this? Um, I'm gonna try to bring up Jim Laurie, who is also a journalist who covered the region is, is on the uh, Zoom and or in the audience. And if I can manage it, I wanna, invite him to to join us and see if he ha has additional thoughts to uh, uh, if I'm finding him still no I'm not finding him on the participants page so he may have gone off um, any any other from the comment from the q a or now things are showing up on the chat Steve Geiger, in the Q&A had an interesting uh, comment as a, having been a B-52 navigator um, and uh, what his experience was. Uh, that was at 2.47 PM if you're looking back through the, the Q&A. Um, and Carolyn Eisenberg also pointed out that uh, Johnson was not willing to accept US withdrawal unless North Vietnam also withdrew hit its troops so that there were serious yeah. problems on both sides of the negotiation, potential that's negotiation. Yes, I, I should have mentioned that. That's absolutely right. Uh, I guess I would like to uh, throw something out with the, with the panelists maybe as a closing thought. Um, I don't want to cut anybody off, but a couple of months after the uh, Resolution that, or the legislative, the, the, the appropriations clauses that we've been talking about. Congress then passed the War Powers Act. Was it in November, was it? And I'm just wondering what uh, any of you think it, what the, was the lasting effect, or was there a lasting effect? Did, did, did the events that we've been talked that we've been remembering really change the balance between the executive and the legislative branch when it came to war making powers? What do you think, Jack? Yep, uh, having been uh, intimately involved with that piece of legislation, uh, it has uh, lasted through these many years, despite being attacked uh, repeatedly. Uh, I, I it had an a, an effect in a couple of ways. Um, the, um, uh, for example, it affected uh, in El Salvador. It affected the. Uh, terms of reference of the United States troops down there. Uh, they kept about a combat. As soon as they went to combat, they'd have to trigger it. It was triggered during the, uh, uh, during the United States incursion into Lebanon. And um, a number of uh, Marines were killed in a, in, when their barracks was blown up. And the Congress used that to get the troops out of Lebanon. So there, it has had an intermittent uh, effect. The Congress, unfortunately, in after 9-11 and ensuing years, has passed these sort of broad war powers uh, enactments, and uh, they have been used by the administration uh, ad, ad nauseum, uh, to my thinking. But um, it's still on the books. I still think it can be operated, remain operative. Uh, uh, but um, it requires the Congress itself to have the gumption and the grit to be able to do it. 
Yeah, but thank you. That's a very cogent and uh, knowledgeable answer. I appreciate it. Elizabeth, I wanted to ask, did, did, do I remember correctly that you interview, you were interviewed Pol Pot at some point? Is that true? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, and I mentioned it and some people have asked about it. And that um, uh, we don't, um, I'd rather, it's such a different and difficult subject. I'd rather not get into it right now. Um, but yes, I spent two years in, I mean, two weeks in Cambodia. The last two weeks actually when the Khmer Rouge was in power and my last day, I interviewed Pol Pot and it's in my book and I really can't go, I, it's not easy for me. So I'd rather not talk about it. Okay. okay. Um, the one thing I would add to the vets that was striking to me is that um, they were not, they were, they were so rejected by the establishment. And I don't think this, this comes across. Um, there were so many Vietnam veterans against the war, but the VFW, um, they were told, told they were losers and they were hippies. They were not accepted by the establishment. They, um, they didn't have any victory parades. They were not welcome when they came home. And I remember when um, they had to build their own memorial and the day that it, it was opened, um, Reagan, it was, must have been 1983-ish, I can't remember. The pres President Reagan wouldn't go to open it because he didn't think it was patriotic a month. But um, you know, I was there, and the vet huge number of veterans came. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs, um, uh, Jack Vesey, General Vesey, came. Um, he led them. He was he would he worked with them. But they were crying. They were saying that's the first time that they were recognized for for you know answering the call, being drafted, whatever, and um, they were recognized. And um, I think that's one piece of the veteran experience that um, is forgotten if ever known. Yes, some were spat on, yes, and all that sort of stuff. But the best um, re, um, thing I learned coming back mm -hmm. after the war and reporting, covering the vets was how they felt that the establishment didn't take care of them. Steve Geiger, are you hearing me? I hear oh. you. Okay. Did you uh, want to, Steve is the person who was a navigator. Oh. Did you want to comment some more on that? Well, I I posted a, a question after that, more about the present day lack of opposition to the wars, and I wonder. Uh, I, I I think the having a you know a privatized army, which is what we have now, um, has removed the veterans as a as a vocal point. Although there's an active number of um, anti-war uh, Iraq and Afghanistan vets, but. It, the 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 protest movement has been pretty silent since I don't know I went to a protest in for the Desert Storm which I think was 1990 and somewhere in there um, and since then it, there just hasn't been a stomach for it in the in the people on the street uh, I wonder if if you, someone could comment about you know public opinion and and its role uh, together with the veterans who opposed the war. Larry, yeah. or go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I don't have anything to say. What, what was... <laughs> Sorry, I was distracted. What was the question? Uh, um, th th there seems to be a lack of public opinion and, and veterans and, and in general opposing the wars since then, um, which have been pretty much continuous. Can do you think this the fact we privatized the army? I mean, there there is an active group of Iraq and Afghanistan vets against the war, but that doesn't seem to be quite the sting that we were able to provide before. Do you think having a privatized army has um, served th that purpose? I don't. I can't really answer that since I haven't been active in in any of those. Um, particular periods of time are involved. Okay. Anybody else? Carolyn, um, anybody else wanna come on? This is a little tricky adding people in, but I'm happy to try to, to do it if uh, 
Okay, Bill Nash, let me see where you are. John, can I talk while? Yeah, go, no, no, go ahead while I'm fiddling with this. Anybody who has something to say yeah. should do it while I'm trying well, to. I wanted to ask, answer John Kim's question um, in the uh, chat, which was, um, how do we contact? How do you contact members of Congress when you are not a constituent of other members of Congress? And um, it's a good point because we didn't do that. We we made a, a point in our call centers that we set up with dozens of people um, in offices that were loaned to us by the United Auto Workers or by a common cause or by particularly church groups, religious groups, the United Methodist Church, the United Presbyterian Church, the United Church. Many of these um, religious anti-religious organizations had offices in Washington and had been doing very serious anti-Vietnam and education work about Vietnam for years before um, 1973 when all this took place. But they offered us phone banks where we could call uh, and, and uh, com uh, compile influencers in each district. So we didn't in Washington particularly approach members of Congress, although we would go door to door and bring them information and pamphlets and documents and memos that were produced by the Indochina Resource Center uh, like by people like Fred Braffman and Christy Macy, or by Don Luce, or by the IVS volunteers. In fact, one of them, Jane Barton, came directly from Vietnam and David Barton to work for the coalition to stop funding the war and meet individually with members of Congress. But mainly to uh, work the levers of power was our, sta our staff people going to these call centers that we set up and calling people in those districts to see how decisions were made by those Congress members. Who influenced them? Who were their friends? What churches did they go to? Go to? And then we called them to ask to contact the members, not us. And that's how we had that kind of influence that Jack talked about that resulted in the Democratic caucus voting uh, to oppose Indochina aid and particularly moderate Republicans and even some conservative Republicans. Go ahead, John. Okay, Canton. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, I just had a couple of comments about the uh, Cambodian developments. Introduce, so, yourse introduce yourself a minute. Uh, Kenton Clymer. I'm a former uh, retired professor of Northern Illinois University and wrote a couple of books about uh, US relations with Cambodia. Um, a couple of questions or, or comments about the kind of end of the the end of Cambodia before the Khmer Rouge came in. Or, um, Elizabeth uh, mentioned uh, that uh, Sihanouk had more or less gone over to the Khmer Rouge, but also mentioned uh, later that uh, that um, he was open to talking with the United States and Kissinger refused to talk with him directly. And I think that's a really important point. I mean, we don't know what would have happened for sure, of course, if that had happened, and uh, would, would that have prevented the horrors of the Khmer Rouge? No one knows for sure, but it wasn't uh, tried. And Zhou Enlai, uh, in his discussions with uh, Kissinger in 1973, urged him to talk directly with um, Sihanouk. Um, but he he would not do it until much too late in 1975. Uh, the other the other just a little point uh, concerning um, Elizabeth Becker's comment about the uh, not 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 understanding the horrors of the Khmer Rouge that would take place before they took place. Um, there's some qualification on that I think because uh, in 1974, uh, a Foreign Service officer I think it was Kenneth Quinn. Uh, wrote a uh, detailed, uh, in-depth study about the areas that in, in Cambodia that the Khmer Rouge already controlled, uh, and uh, the uh, the foreshadowing of, of what would take place was, I think, quite clear in that report. So, if anybody read that report at the State Department, uh, they surely would have uh, would have known that. Uh, so that's all. <laughs> well, um, yes, it was a classified um, document, and. Um, 
I was told about it. I was not allowed to read it, but that was the information I put in my article in 1974. Uh -huh. But even still, it doesn't come close to what the Khmer Rouge did. I mean, you had um, the hints of it. That's why I said foreshadowed. But um, from the first day emptying Phnom Penh, from the first day slaughtering the um, Khmer Republic soldiers, the Khmer Republic, None of that was there. It was all um, how they organized. And yes, they were brutal, but we did not have anything like the level of, of that, nor the then when they um, just became completely anti-expert, anti-intellectual, and um, they're well going on in the conspiracy. The, the, it was, it, you had a sense, and, and I wrote it because I, I, you know, I was told about the Quinn um, document, but doesn't I? I didn't. When it, nonetheless, I was shocked by what the Khmerage did. Shocked. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bill Nash. Thank you. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, I'm a retired soldier that served both in act uh, during the uh, draft army and the uh, volunteer army, and I want to take exception. Uh, to the uh, characterization of today's military as being a privatized army. The soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that volunteer to serve today take an oath of office, swearing allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and in a larger sense to the United States of America and their citizens. A privatized force does not do that. I understand that the issue a lot of people are concerned with, and there's even been some chat comments, is about the lack of a draft and an all-volunteer army. And it's well documented today that recruiting is very, very difficult. And most of the armed forces are not making their quotas, especially the army. And I would just say that's an issue that goes well beyond the military. That is a national issue, uh, but to characterize those who serve as privateers uh, is not right. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, Tim Carney, uh, important name to a number of us has asked to speak. Go ahead. Sorry. He seems to be muted. Uh, that was, yeah, I clicked the wrong thing. All right, how's and that? All right, go ahead, right. Tim. Yes, yeah. this is uh, relevant to the discussion between Ken Clymer and Elizabeth Becker on Ken Quinn's uh, report. Elizabeth will recall that we had lunch at a rather good uh, uh, French restaurant in Phnom Penh to discuss a memoir published as a book by Id Sarin, uh, entitled In Khmer, uh, My Regrets of or For the Khmer Soul, in which he introduced uh, to the rest of, of Cambodia, perhaps not everybody, but most of, of us foreigners, as well as many Khmer, that it, the Khmer Rouge were, in fact, the Communist Party of Kampuchea. Elizabeth is also correct in noting the uh, the activities of the Khmer Rouge that Ken Quinn described could have been interpreted, and I, to my uh, uh, regret, also did, as the exigencies of a movement under serious military stress in time of war. The other point to make is that Ken Quinn's document went to the Department of State as an airgram. Now, what that means is it was airmailed. It was not a telegram. It would have arrived in the post, uh, the diplomatic post by bag, diplomatic bag. It would have been read at the desk level. And I am mystified as to imagine how it ever would have gotten up to any senior level of the Department of State at the time. Thanks. Tim, could you, or Elizabeth, could you introduce Tim and say something about who he is and why what he said is so relevant? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry you didn't introduce him. He was Tim, political officer at the embassy, Khmer speaker, and um, uh, uh, an honest, an honest political officer. And 
Yes, uh, Regrets of the Khmer Soul by Yitz was very important for me when I wrote my piece about the Khmer Rouge. Tim went on um, to serve in Southeast Asia and was an ambassador in Sudan and um, Haiti and remains a friend to a lot of us in South, who care about Southeast Asia. And who, for whom I have a special affection because when we had the Cambodian dancers in the US and were accused of imprisoning him in their hotel so they couldn't defect, Tim sat down in Khmer in privacy interviewing every one of them before they went back to Phnom Penh. So uh, I think it's a footnote on the history that I was personally very grateful to. Um, Paul Lauder, you had something you wanted to say. Um, it's, it's in a slightly different vein, just to illustrate. When we were in, in Cambodia, and I, I can't tell you exactly when, I think in the 80s, we met um, a young American woman who ran a wonderful, very small gallery in Phnom Penh. Um, and uh, her boyfriend taught across the street uh, in the um, arts college or university. And we got to uh, speak with them a little bit and um, uh, got to know them slightly. And um, he asked, if we'd be interested in meeting his father, who was a mask maker, who had made masks for the dance um, theater. And um, so we, we did, we got on their, on their scooters and went and climbed up um, an external ladder and, and ultimately met the, the father. And we asked how it was that they managed to survive um, when the Khmer Rouge uh, took over in Phnom Penh, one of the things they did was to look at people's hands, men's hands. And uh, as far as they were concerned, if your hands show that you were worker and, and not some intellectual who um, didn't work, uh, if you were a worker, you were more or less okay. They managed the, the the father and son because their hands were full of, um, uh, you know, um, the kind of thing that, that you develop um, when, when you're working with your hands. Callus says, yeah. Um, uh, they managed to bury their tools, tools in the backyard uh, so that when um, the, the Khmer Rouge was ultimately defeated, they could dig up the tools and go back to the process of, of making masks. But the way in which they survived was their calloused hands. And that tells you, I think, something uh, at once um, powerful and awful about what was going on. Thank you. Paul is a retired professor of American studies and also a member of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. So, um, Skip and others, do you have any final words before I we close it down? No. I, I guess the one thing that sort of came to my mind while I was listening to this uh, was Elizabeth probably will verify, will. I, I think she'll verify me uh, on this. I think that what was most chilling for the veterans, the Vietnam veterans who came home was not so much hostility, although it felt like it was hostility, but silence. You know, it was six, seven years after the war ended. You hardly heard anything about it. It was only when the, at the time the memorial was dedicated in 1981, that sort of broke the dam and people began reliving those experiences. But that was six years after the war ended and, and eight years after the last American troops came home. And veterans came home and I think they themselves had no words. They didn't, you know, this war was not in the mold that they had learned about. I think a huge percentage of Vietnam veterans must have been the children, the sons of World War II veterans, which I, well, I, my dad wasn't a veteran, but I was a second generation war correspondent. My father was a correspondent in World War II. And that was our model of war and Vietnam just didn't fit that. 
And I think that was one of the reasons why it was it, it was never sort of seen very clearly for the, the type of war that it was. And one of the reasons that the military was so spectacularly unable to use its huge superiority and resources to, to get uh, better results on the battlefield. So that's, you know, we breaking the silence uh, is one thing that we tried to do here too. So anyway, I want to thank uh, Jack and Elizabeth and Larry once again for what I thought was a very interesting and illuminating uh, conversation.